Good morning and welcome to May 25th Talks with Tobin. Thank you all for joining us. Before we get started with From Jerusalem to Berlin, I just want to take a moment to recognize uh, today, which is the uh, one year anniversary of the murder of George Floyd. Uh, first, ADL has issued a statement uh, commemorating uh, this day. I just want to read uh, a brief excerpt and it'll also be placed in the chat uh, if you'd like to read the full statement. Uh, ADL today, one year after the murder of George Floyd by Minneapolis police officers, renewed our call for real change to tackle systemic racism, reimagine public safety, and create transformational change to ensure justice and fair treatment for Black and other marginalized communities. As we look back on this past year, uh, at all the advancements, at all the struggles, uh, we know that there's much work in front of us. I also invite y'all to join us on June 2nd for part two of our series, Understanding Systemic Racism. Uh, on the June 2nd, we will be looking at systemic racism in banking and housing industries. That'll be June 2nd at noon, and also a link will be put into the chat. So thank you for considering joining that important webinar and thanks everyone for all the work that uh, y'all have been contributing in this effort for transformational change. Uh, now it is a pleasure uh, to welcome to Talks with Tobin, uh, a former colleague and an old friend of ADL. Uh, Laura Cam worked for ADL for 17 years in New York, Washington, Jerusalem, as co-director of ADL's Israel office, uh, she worked in a number of areas, including media relations uh, for the league, as well as organizing and implementing missions that brought key US senators and members of Congress and governors, law enforcement officials, interfaith leaders, journalists, and others to Israel and Jordan and Palestinian Authority. Uh, I got to know Laura, not, uh, not at ADL, but when we worked together at the uh, Israel Project, I believe from about 2008 to 2011, uh, and we did some, some wonderful work uh, for the Israel Project, which worked with members of the media in order to uh, help uh, people better understand uh, what was happening um, in Israel and the Middle East. Uh, she now uh, runs CAM Global Strategies, uh, which is a, a global uh, communication strategic, strategic global communication strategies firm. Um, and she's married to the Israeli ambassador to Germany, uh, Jeremy uh, Isakaroff. Uh, and as a side note, uh, her husband is the cousin of Avi Isakaroff, who is the Times of Israel Middle East analyst and co-creator of the Netflix series, Fauda. Laura, my first question to you is, when will season four be released? Um, and if you have that information, uh, <laughs> you can share that with us later. Actually, what I really want to start off is, uh, is first, I know that it's been a challenging couple of weeks. I know that you've been in Berlin, but I know that your kids have been in Israel. How are they? They're fine. They're, uh, my sons are former uh, combat soldiers. Uh, they're very brave, and it seems that uh, nothing really uh, uh, touches them. Uh, my daughter is in uh, Jerusalem. Luckily, Jerusalem was uh, pretty much, for the most part, um, out of the uh, out of the picture. But it's been pretty harrowing for us, the parents that have not been with them uh, at this time. Even though they're in their twenties, we still want to uh, be close to them and uh, try to protect them in some way. So, if you could just maybe talk about the last two weeks, what have you been doing just in terms of staying in contact? with people in Israel and, and, you know, how did you communicate and, and, right. and what was so, it like? Yeah. Right. So, so what happened was um, I actually went, uh, was in New York for the, uh, the whole time. Um, I went to visit my mother who I hadn't seen in a year and a half due to COVID. 
Um, at the same time, my husband was uh, going to go to Israel and then this broke out and uh, my husband was not allowed to go to Israel because all Israeli diplomats were um, told to stay in country um, in order to deal with uh, working with uh, the governments that they're working with. So they were really alone. Um, and it was, uh, it was quite, uh, it was difficult. Somehow when you're Israeli, even though things are happening there, one feels safer in a sense being there um, than being far away. So it, 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 was, it was difficult. It was a difficult uh, few weeks. Of course, I was in touch with uh, my kids constantly, my other relatives there, my uh, friends. Yeah. You know, and, and I know that, you know, in this country, we've obviously seen a significant rise in anti uh, Semitic events, uh, particularly in places like Los Angeles and New York, uh, where there have been assaults and 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 other kinds of of uh, physical kinds of, of of events. But also, Europe has Absolutely. seen a rise uh, in the last two weeks. You know, what have what have you seen? Um, well, we have seen um, quite large demonstrations, anti-Israel demonstrations that have uh, definite anti-Semitic uh, elements to them. Um, there have been calls uh, against uh, Jews. Um, there have been synagogue desecrations um, in Germany in the past few weeks. Um, it's been a very, very difficult time. But I, I, I will say this, if I may, um, what we saw in terms of the German government is that they've been incredibly supportive um, of what's been going on uh, in Israel, of, of, of Israeli actions. Um, the foreign minister, uh, Heiko Maas, went to uh, Israel. Um, that has been very uh, a soothing element, I would say. But it's a, it hasn't been good for the Jewish community in, uh, in Germany for quite some time. And, this exacerbated the uh, situation. How, how large is the Jewish community in Germany now? So it's hard to know because um, it, it's a very different system um, here. A, if one wants to belong to the Jewish community here and one pays taxes, um, not everybody does. So we believe there are between 120 and 200,000 uh, Jews. There are quite a number of Israelis, particularly in Berlin. We're not sure, uh, again, of how many, between 10 and 30,000, which is uh, quite uh, a large uh, number. And, and how has the German government been responding to these, to these protests that have, you know, sort of merged into the anti-Semitic sphere? What has been their response? So again, they've been incredibly um, supportive of the Jewish community, they're um, out there uh, talking, right, you know, immediately um, issuing statements, going to the places where there are uh, anti-Semitic uh, incidents. Really, the 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 government has been more than uh, supportive. They 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 say um, Angela Merkel, the uh, Chancellor of Germany, has said that. Uh, the protection of Israel is uh, Germany's raison d'etre and they're acting as such, but there's only so much they can do. The, the problems emerge, um, I mean, when we're talking kind of officially is uh, there are issues in the army, it's much like uh, in the United States actually, in uh, the armed forces and in the police of uh, far rights uh, extremists, and uh, that has been uh, concerning for all involved. And, you know, it must be a particularly, you know, to say the least, an interesting experience for you. Your, I believe, is your mother and your, you know, your grandmother were were born in in yes. Germany. Yes, uh, you, you lost family in the Holocaust, and and here you are, you know, now now stationed as a diplomatic family uh, in in Berlin and, and now you're, you know, seeing some of the same kinds of, of hate, you know, recycled. 
can you can you just kind of talk about that? What does that feel like? Mark, it's been um, it's almost been surrealistic. Um, you know, we never thought as a as a diplomatic family, for whatever reason, my my husband was very um, American based. Um, he had served it uh, in the UN in New York and then in Washington twice, and Germany just really wasn't uh, on our radar. Um, and then when actually the prime minister, uh, uh, Netanyahu, asked uh, Jeremy to come here to serve, we were, as uh, ambassador, we were kind of stunned. It was just simply uh, no place we really ever thought of spending time in, particularly me who grew up in a home where, you know, we wouldn't buy any German goods, no German car, no German appliances, never stepped foot in Germany. It, you know, it just wasn't... Uh, you know, Germany was not on our uh, radar, and if it was, it was uh, in a very negative way. Um, so when we came, it was uh, a real learning experience, um, and it's been unbelievably interesting, um, and it's been difficult, also, in in in, in a lot of ways. In in what ways has it really been challenging? <laughs> well, particularly in Berlin. Um, I don't know if you've ever been here. History just smacks you in the face mm -hmm. every day. So your one is, if you're attuned to it, is constantly reminded of the Holocaust. You, you, you simply can't get away from it. And that's because the German government wants it that way. Um, so there are memorials everywhere. They have... Um, what's called uh, stumbling stones in, in, in the uh, street where in front of uh, buildings where Jews lived and were deported and died, there are the uh, black brass plaques on the street with the names of the people who used to live in the buildings, uh, the day that they were uh, deported, the day that they were murdered, um, and they're everywhere. Um, we actually um, went to uh, Dortmund a couple months ago and uh, set some of them down uh, for my great grandparents who um, uh, one of them uh, died in uh, Theresienstadt and the other died in the ghetto in uh, Dortmund where they put mm -hmm. before they uh, were deported. So it's been, you know, for me, um, it's been very, very heavy. Sure. And, sure. Yeah. And, and for my husband, who actually comes from a um, more of a uh, Sephardic uh, background, um, he, him and his family, they were never touched. They're, they're actually six generations uh, in Jerusalem, and they kind of dealt with uh, all of uh, you know, what was going on there, but they really were not touched uh, by the Holocaust at all. And so for him, he is kind of related to the Holocaust through me and now his children who are third generation uh, survivors. And it's been very uh, touching for him as well. And, and, and do you think that the, the government's effort at providing these reminders, do you think it's effective or do you think that it, you know, it, at some point, um, it, it may have a backlash. You know, I, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was, you know, there was an article recently that said, um, you know, extremist activity in, in Germany was up uh, significantly, uh, the 20 year high uh, and increased sharply in 2020. I think it was a yeah, two decade high uh, and accounted for, I think tw over 23,000 criminal offenses uh, and more than half, you know, were, were politically motivated. Um, you know, and it's hard to necessarily say that they were related, whether they were anti-Semitic or not, I, you know, don't know per se, but, you know, what are your thoughts? Is it, is it helpful? Uh, or, or is there something else that is prompting this increase in, in, in extremism, which, by the way, we're seeing elsewhere in, in, the, in the world? Right, so I, I, I think that uh, Germany is definitely part of this uh, worldwide trend um, of uh, 
right-wing extremists uh, being emboldened um, due to various uh, factors. Um, there definitely is an increase of anti-Semitic incidents um, in Germany. Um, polls, and I believe ADL polls uh, as well, have consistently found a quite a high level of anti-Semitism in Germany. Um, it's very, it's impossible to feel uh, comfortable in being in some neighborhoods um, if you are a Jew that is identifiable. Mm -hmm. um, that is uh, both on, on the right and the left. Uh, there are, uh, you know, anti-Semites uh, both places. Um, statistics show However, that uh, the majority of anti-Semitic incidents are coming from um, the right here. And, you know, you're, you know, I understand that you are the, you know, the spouse of a, of, of a diplomat, but, but you come into this position quite uniquely. You obviously, you know, work for ADL for, for 17 years and, you know, you've worked, you know, for the Israeli consulate early in your career, mm -hmm. you worked for the Israel Project. Um, I can't remember for for quite some time as well because you you predated uh, my my time time with mm -hmm. that. And so, uh, and then obviously in your current uh, work as a as a consultant, uh, so you have um, a very unique view of of what's happening, uh, and uh, separate and apart from sort of the diplomatic view and you know do you have any you know as you look at the events through that prism of, of your past you know experiences you know do you see things in like okay this is what this is what needs to be done or this is what would be helpful you know what comes to mind when you see these issues you know in, in terms of uh, uh, communications efforts um, you know, I, I, I was actually thinking, I was with uh, the Israel Project for seven years, actually. And I was thinking about uh, the work that uh, we did with uh, Frank Luntz, the, um, you know, Fox TV uh, anchor, uh, not, not sure. anchor, um, uh, 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 yeah. consultant, yeah. Uh, yeah, pollster, pollster. Um, and, and, and the work he did for us um, also, uh, Stan Greenberg's work uh, with us during the war in Gaza in 2014. And so much of the um, communications efforts should be the same in terms of uh, the messages. Um, and I think that, you know, there's been, people have been slow to get out messages in Israel and there have been complaints. Uh, but having said that, I, 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 I do think that in general, the communications efforts have been pretty good. I think newspapers um, and media, at least in, in Germany and the United States, have been pretty supportive um, this time. Um, I think what's happening to in, in, in America and Germany um, is, is a a change in, 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 in the political sphere, um, mostly amongst uh, the left, um, that is something that uh, really needs to be dealt with. I think it's new um, and different what's happening now. So I think, so that's what I think needs to be focused on if, if, if you would ask me professionally. Right. And, you know, looking at the work that, you know, the Israel Project did and, and that we, we did when, when we were there, it was focused mm -hmm. on the media, using the media uh, and working with them so that they could more accurately tell the story of what was what was happening in Israel. And, and now, uh, like you said, it's not sometimes the media is good, sometimes it's not. But because of social media, they exactly. don't, the media necessarily, or traditional media isn't needed. The story is being told in different ways and there's no reliance on 
on the media. And so people are relying on just, you know, others, people that they know, right? And- Mark, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, in 2014, uh, during uh, that Gulf uh, War, during that uh, Gaza war, a, there was no social media uh, per se, or certainly um, as we have it now. Now it's a, a whole different thing. There are people uh, speaking uh, to each other in echo chambers. Um, definitely, that's a, a new a new problem um, that needs uh, that needs to be worked on. A absolutely, but when we're talking about the uh, mass media, the traditional media, um, I, I think by and large, I, I, I know that people will probably you know completely uh, disagree with me. They'll talk about the New York Times. They'll, uh, but, and there have been issues. <laughs> Um, just uh, recently um, uh, with the New York Times that uh, many are uh, pretty uh, angry about, um, but I would have to say by and large, um, the story is getting out um, that Israel did what, uh, what they needed to do and uh, that things were pretty proportional, I would say, I would say. And are you are you able to, to, to follow the social media in Germany as well? Or? Um, there's there's a tremendous amount of anti forget about anti Israel. There's a tremendous amount of anti uh, Semitism um, on uh, social media here, and uh, I believe actually ADL is uh, working on that. Um, with, uh, <laughs> we some, are. Uh, yes, with uh, thanks thanks for the plug. Yes. Right, with some uh, very important uh, foundations here. And I think that um, the foundations here need ADL's expertise um, in this. And so I'm thrilled that a a ADL uh, is involved, um, but it's, it's very, very huge. And I don't know that anybody has completely figured it out yet. I think we're figuring out what to do with the social media. I think it's a, um, there are laws that are much uh, more stringent here in, uh, in Europe than in the United States. Uh, we don't uh, have a first amendment here. Uh, the government can be um, more stringent, but uh, it's a huge, it's, it's just a, it's, it's a huge problem. Uh, I, I want to get into the more, I guess, business perspective and, and, and what you're doing, you know, from the consulting perspective, but I, I just want to finish up on, um, you know, this, this one, one aspect of, you know, sort of the life as part of the diplomatic family, uh, and, and I know, you know, you know, most of your time, I believe, you know, is consumed with with your own work. But are do you have certain obligations as well as being the spouse of the Israel's ambassador to Germany? So that's a that's an interesting question. Um, the honest truth is that um, the system doesn't really care all that much about uh, what spouses do or don't do. Um, I'm not employed um, by the uh, Israeli Foreign uh, Service. Um, basically everything that I do is because I want to do it. I'm interested in doing it and I want to support my husband. Um, but the system, you know, they're not counting how many dinners I host right. or how many events um, I go to. Having said that, um, even though I am uh, working, there are things about being the wife of uh, an ambassador that I really enjoy. Um, please, please share. Right, so I, I belong to um, an organization of uh, spouses of, uh, of diplomats here. And uh, basically if I wasn't working, I could be busy every minute of every day with all of the events that they do. But my favorite things, the, the favorite things that I do um, is that I belong to a group of uh, 
actually, this is interesting. I belong to a group of Western European diplomat ambassadors' wives, and we meet in different residences for for lunches and 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 talks. And so, it, the reason that I belong to the Western European group is because the Arabic countries don't accept me in their group. That is, there are different groups right. as there are in the UN. So there's the Western European group, there's the Middle East group, uh, there's the Latin American group, and the Middle East group doesn't uh, accept Israel. And the, they say that they don't accept Israel because they're basically Arabic speaking group. And that's how they kind of get out of right. accepting me. And the Western European group is nice enough, really, and more accepting enough to uh, to allow me to uh, belong to them. So it's great to see, you know, how the other uh, ambassadors uh, live and really develop relationships with the uh, wives of the um, other ambassadors. I also, you know, do things like play tennis and Pilates with the. Uh, with this organization and it's pretty great. And then there was something you did that I, I thought was actually pretty cool with something in, involving a boat. Yes, yes. So you know, the amazing thing about, one of the amazing things about Germany, uh, German-Israel relations is that uh, Germany, uh, Germany is uh, master shipbuilders and uh, they are building um, Corvette, ships and submarines uh, for the Israeli Navy. And we were invited to, um, I was invited actually to christen, or in Israel, we don't call it christen. We call it, <laughs> we call it name, name the, the boat, which is traditional before a boat leaves the port where it was built and makes its way to its home port in this case, uh, Haifa. Um, a woman traditionally is the one who christens the boat, who you know takes a bottle of champagne and smacks it against uh, the ship. This was a uh, 90 meter ship. It was pretty uh, large. Um, it was extremely, extreme. It was one of the most uh, moving things I've uh, ever done as a uh, the wife of, uh, or the spouse of an ambassador. And what's the what's the name of the ship? I I, I know it's not a boat, but but what's the uh, name? Oz, Oz, O Z, means uh, strength or courage. Um, it was quite something, and it, and it really spoke to the um, the strength of the relationship between uh, Germany and Israel that. Most people don't realize there, 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 there are a lot of uh, organizations that are very focused on um, negativity on Germans' uh, relationship to uh, Israel. Um, but I have to say, and now I'm stepping out of my, um, my wife of the ambassador role and I'm just speaking uh, for myself, but it's quite, I think people don't really realize the incredible strength of uh, the relationship in all fields, um, be it scientific, um, economic, I know the building of the uh, Navy vessels. I mean, think about it. Germany is building Navy vessels right. so that Israel can defend itself. It's quite, uh, it's quite remarkable. Um, so, you know, in, in that sense, it's, uh, it's been very positive, uh, you know, for me as the child of Holocaust survivors to be here and, and, and feel, you know, that much more comfortable, even though there are definitely things going on here that I would say are trending in a uh, negative, in a negative way, and and, and so again, I, I'll say that from a government official perspective, 
it's, you know, I feel really positive, but from a on the ground people perspective, um, there are troubling uh, signs. So, you know, it seems that, you know, Germany and, and even, and maybe in answer this as well, that other European countries are, are they, you know, interested and willing to do business with Israel? Is that? Uh, I think uh, the EU is Israel's largest uh, trading partner. If you take all of the countries together. Right. So even more than the United States. So, oh, definitely. Definitely. A lot of business. So, yeah. So it's a really interesting, uh, you know, I think distinction that you're, you're talking about between, I guess, you know, so the government and, and business, and then, you know, I guess sort of the sentiment of, of, uh, you know, sort of more of the, you know, other, you know, people in the have, have different feelings. And I, you know, how do you, how do you navigate kind of that, the canyon? Well, I, you know, I, I, I think that uh, the Israeli uh, governments and, you know, the foreign ministry and the ministry of industry and trade and, you know, all those ministries are, are you know, we have uh, lots of offices here um, that, that are dealing with uh, various uh, government ministries. And they're working hard and they're developing relations. Uh, look, let's face it, um, Israel is so far ahead in terms of um, technology that, for example, almost all of the major is, uh, German car companies are now opening R&D offices in Israel. So Germany makes, you know, amazing, you know, builds amazing cars, but they have not been able to deal with the new technology that mm -hmm. must go into new cars now. Um, and Israel is. And so just, you know, on that level, the, there's been incredible cooperation between, for example, you know, Mercedes and Volkswagen and, uh, you know, all, all of the uh, car companies in Israel and people might not uh, know, uh, you know, Mobileye, the uh, company that uh, invented uh, the artificial intelligence for driverless cars, you know, is, uh, you know, an, an Israeli company. Uh, now, now it's been sold to Intel, but, uh, you know, they're still in, uh, in Israel. So, there's a tremendous amount of uh, business. And, and so switching gears a little bit in terms of your, your work uh, as, a, as, a, as a consultant, is it fair to call you the cannabis queen of Israel? Is that the appropriate, is that, is that the right well, nomenclature? Uh, the, Jerusalem Post Mag <laughs> the Jerusalem Post magazine uh, put me on the cover uh, and called me the cannabis queen. Yes, I thought I heard a, that. A, a nomen I'm, I'm pr and proud of it. Um, um, but perhaps you can give a little description as to what, what that actually means. And, and also, I think when we talked before, you said that, that medical cannabis is... Yes. Uh, the, the cherry medical. tomatoes of the of the 20, 21st century for Israel. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, the story is um, after I uh, left the, um, the Israel project and opened up my own uh, consulting firm, it was about 10 years ago, medical cannabis, medical cannabis has been legal in, uh, in, in Israel for about 30 years, over 30 years. Uh, a little known uh, fact, um, but it's been illegal everywhere else almost. And when cannabis started to become um, more accept, when medical cannabis started to become more accepted um, throughout uh, Europe and uh, the United States, um, Israel were really the leaders in uh, medical cannabis R&D because they basically, you know, almost invented it in uh, Hebrew University. Um, and, and since uh, they've had uh, patients for over 30 years, they had a tremendous amount of data um, on 
strains, you know, specific strains and what uh, medical cannabis was good for and, and not good for. So um, I uh, approached uh, some of the uh, scientists and growers and uh, people in the field and said that I would be, you know, more than willing to do uh, PR for them. Um, and they were very accepting. And I, I'd have to say that I, I, I feel like uh, I and some others in Israel, we really put medical cannabis and Israeli medical cannabis on the map. And uh, Israel is the leader in uh, R&D and there's been a tremendous amount of investment in Israeli uh, medical cannabis companies. Um, and there are a lot of Israeli medical cannabis companies that are now also, um, their R&D is based in Israel, but they have corporate uh, headquarters uh, throughout the United States. And so what is this on a practical basis? You know, it's, how does it uh, translate into actual uh, okay. pharmaceutical yeah. products? Right, so um, almost every um, major hospital and uh, research, medical research uh, organization in Israel is doing um, research on uh, medical cannabis. I mean, we're talking about um, Weizmann, we're talking about Volcani Institute, which is, I mean, when you talk about um, uh, cherry tomatoes, uh, they're, they're doing uh, studies on the genetics of the cannabis seeds and, 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 and working to put seeds together to make uh, medical cannabis uh, more workable for various diseases from um, Crohn's disease, which is like really a very uh, kind of Jewish uh, disease to uh, helping people deal with uh, chemo, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, Parkinson's. I mean, the, the list goes uh, on and on and on. Um, so Israel really has the uh, R&D and it's been illegal in the United States because the federal uh, guidelines to do research on cannabis in the United States. So Israel is really, Israel's the one where everybody's looking towards. Uh, now it's slowly, slowly changing uh, in the United States. There are just a few places where uh, it's possible to do uh, research now, um, but not much. So really Israel is the, uh, the, the place. Um, and, you know, there, there was a sense that uh, Israel might uh, grow, Israel's growing cannabis and exporting it I, and would like to export it, but hasn't been able to due to uh, the fact that we haven't had uh, government for a long time. And now actually, you know, cannabis is uh, legal in 30 states in the United States and uh, it's being grown, you know, at home. So. Right. right. And, and what are some of the other... Uh, industries that you're working with or any other products that you think might uh, be of interest? Yeah, I, I, I just um, recently uh, worked with a client, an artificial intelligence uh, company that is uh, using AI to increase sales um, for huge companies that have like hundreds of salespeople, like Zoom, for example, is uh, one of their uh, clients. And they're doing AI for sales training which is uh, quite interesting. I, I also have uh, clients that are nonprofit organizations. Um, I'm working with uh, Jewish People Policy Institute uh, in Jerusalem, um, working with uh, actually one of the uh, foundations that ADL is uh, working with here on, that I mentioned on uh, anti-Semitism on the uh, web. So I, I I, I really wanted to keep my hand in uh, the Jewish world because that's where I started that, you know, at ADL, that's been my passion. Um, but, you know, business is good too. And I want to ask you a little bit more about your work at ADL, but didn't you mention something about a bulletproof backpack? Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I worked with a company. Um, that, uh, yeah, that manufactured uh, bulletproof uh, vests uh, that came out during the time of all of these uh, shootings. Um, 
yeah. It's an Israeli company. It's not the only. Uh, it's not the only one um, on the market. Um, that was, uh, you know, it's difficult. You know, on one hand, you don't want to scare parents. On the other hand, parents, you know, want their kids uh, to be safe. It's uh, that. That's an interesting, uh, interesting client. I was. I've also um, been in uh, the UAE uh, not so long ago. A meeting with um, uh, public relations companies there to hook up with them um, and to see if we can work together on uh, clients from the UAE getting media coverage in Israel and in the uh, international Jewish press and having Israeli companies get media coverage throughout the Gulf. I mean, if, if you get media coverage basically in Dubai, then you'll hit uh, the rest of the, uh, the Gulf. This happens after the Abraham Accords, of course. So that was a real opportunity. Yeah, there, there's a there's a, a question that, that's been raised uh, and I'm sorry, Mark, we have lost audio. We can't hear you. All right, am I back? You are yes. back, thank you. Okay, uh, sorry about that. Um, uh, so there's a question that was that was raised and I'll, I think I'll modify it a little bit to, to expand on it. Uh, you, you know, when, when we worked, uh, you know, at the Israel Project, there was always a question of if, you know, you can talk about all the good things that Israel is, is doing and some of the things that you just, you just mentioned, all the positives, that, um, that, that that can serve as a counterweight to, uh, to these uh, kind of negative narratives that, that people circulate. And, and I think that the, the research always showed that it was, it was sort of apples and oranges. It just didn't uh, it just didn't uh, didn't have an uh, impact, and and, um, and it doesn't mean that we shouldn't talk about the things that that Israel is doing that help you know you know solve disease and that help um, improve technology and that help everybody's daily life because it is it is critically important, um, uh, but it, it's not a substitute for uh, helping people understand. Uh, you know what's going on with you know on on the ground on any given given day, um, and the, the the question that was raised, you know, has to do with really um, helping people understand just the sort of general narrative, um, because right now there really is, and we talked about this earlier about not sort of beyond misinformation but getting into kind of the disinformation of, of the narrative. And, you know, nobody is perfect. No country is perfect. Uh, but there, there really is uh, now challenges to the underlying facts of history. And I'm just wondering if you really have any thoughts about how best we can kind of address uh, helping people understand sort of the baseline of, of what's been transpiring. Yeah, I, I, you know, Mark, I, I think I would, um, I would say to that, first of all, one of the, one of the things that's, uh, and now, you know, we'll talk really on the uh, level of uh, professionals talking about uh, strategic communications. I think one of the things that we learned at uh, the Israel Project at the time was nobody wants a history lesson. And it's, you know, it's, it's almost impossible to teach uh, anybody history. Um, the, the, the work that we did and that I hope others, I pray others are doing and I would suspect that is being done um, is the qualitative and quantitative research that we did on messaging is critically important um, to get to um, policymakers and spokespeople. Um, we, I, I, as I said before, I think the work that we uh, did in 2014 on the messages that, uh, 
during the, the last Gaza war, probably um, much of it would be uh, the same, but I, I, but we were not are not around now to go and make sure that uh, people are are seeing the messages of Israel wanting peace. That Israel really tried to um, be um, systematic in not having um, civilian casualties. Um, what it means for you know Israelis to be running into uh, shelters, et cetera. How we quickly get those messages out, and how we get those video the video out there. Um, so, I think just as in fighting anti-Semitism, <clears throat> we know that there are a lot of ways to do it, and you can't just focus on one. I think in terms of uh, Israel, let's say Hasbara, as as we call it. Um, it's the same, we need to bring people to Israel, we need to talk to journalists, you know, you need to talk to the uh, journalists in, in, in your part of the world and, you know, meet with the editors and hopefully in the future, you know, wh where you can, you know, bring uh, journalists uh, to Israel as, 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 you know, ADL has done for so long, campus editors, um, I mean, there's just a, a real a menu, a toolbox of uh, what needs to be done. So I, I don't think it's one thing that can answer uh, your question, but you know, there, there are many things. Uh, looking back on your, on your time with ADL, uh, you know, what, what stands out? What do, you, what do you remember most or what did, what did you enjoy most about your time here? I loved working for ADL. Uh, for <laughs> that I stayed for uh, 17 years. Um, it was incredible for me because I, I, I really uh, almost began my career um, at, uh, at ADL. Um, I, I, I had worked, uh, it's true, for the Israeli consulate uh, for uh, several years. And then, then I uh, came to ADL um, in New York and I was really lucky enough to um, develop a relationship with uh, Abe Foxman, our former uh, former director, who allowed me to, every time I moved, because I was married uh, then to my husband, who was an who was Israeli diplomat, we were moving, allowed me to uh, work in uh, New York and then Washington and Jerusalem and then Washington again and Jerusalem again. And so I, I developed my career and I learned about the Jewish communities and working vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, vis -vis different groups in all those places. It was an education that I could not, I don't think I could have uh, gotten elsewhere. Um, when one works for ADL, one really feels like part of a family. Um, and still, even though I haven't worked for ADL for so long, I still feel part of the uh, ADL family. Um, and and People, you know, respond to me as, you know, ADL is respond to me as part of the ADL family. I mean, there are so many of us uh, who who have uh, gotten out, you know, started our careers uh, at ADL um, and are still uh, in touch. It was a education, you know, par excellence. So, um, well, that's terrific. Well, it's, it's so I, mean, I, I, you know, to, just to continue, you know, what can I say? I met. Uh, you know, met, you know, all the people that came to Israel when I was uh, working uh, in the Israel office, all of those missions that uh, we brought, every one of them was an incredible uh, education from, you know, law enforcement to, you know, government, you know, governors, members of Congress. I just, and the work that ADL is quite incredible, I have to say. Uh, absolutely. I'm a well, fan. It's, it's great. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you. Well, it's great to have you. Great to have you back. Uh, at least, at least for the short hour, and uh, you know, I want to thank you. I know it's uh, it's already evening, and uh, in in Berlin, so thank you for for taking time from from your night. Um, and and I, you know, I just want to know that want you to know that uh, that that we are thinking of of, of you and and your family in in Israel, and um, hope that everybody is well. It's so great uh, to have this catch up with you. Um, and hopefully, you know, uh, we'll get to see each other in person, um, you know, some, sometime soon. It won't be uh, another decade, 
uh, be pleasure. before we have that before we have that chance. Um, you know, do you have any parting advice for for those who who are you know working on this on this mission? You know that, that we all share. Well, I would say um, in terms of uh, Israel right now, it, now is really the time to show support um, publicly. If there are rallies, I would urge people to um, to join them. I think it's uh, really important um, for government officials to see that uh, their support on the ground. Um, you know, I, I think it's people should go visit Israel as uh, as soon as they can. Um, I think people should get vaccinated and see uh, and go to Israel because they won't uh, be able to get in um, unless they are vaccinated. Um, but you know, the Israeli uh, tours industry uh, definitely needs you, and uh, you know, you might need Israel too. So. That would be my nice uh, well, well, thank you so much. It was, it was great thank chatting you, and, okay. uh, and take care. Uh, thank you best. all for joining us uh, and uh, have, a, have a great day and have a great Memorial uh, Day Thanks. weekend. You take care. All Keep right. up take your care. good work. Bye. Thank you. you too. Bye-bye. Okay, I'm back.